I'm just trying to tell you, I got back home after war. That ball we don't know. I've often wondered what happened to those families. This wasn't dead people. Now we've got to the point where we're, we're, we're beginning to uh, shoot German planes down in two or three at a time. At one time, one, and during the, bit, well, during the uh, invasion of uh, Anzio, which was our last D-Day in Italy, on one particular weekend, the Germans were using an airplane called the Stuka, which is a dive bomber against the American and the British troops running up the beach. On that one particular weekend, we shot down 17 Stukas between Saturday and Sunday. And we only lost two of our guys. Two guys, two of our guys got killed, 17 of the 17 Germans. Well, this guy here was one of my pilots. He was flying missions with the rest of the guys on strafing missions. On strafing missions, you have to bring the fighter down to the treetop level. Right down to the top of the tree. The, the, the propeller was 15 feet in diameter, so you had to gauge it so you wouldn't be hitting the tree, the tree level. And that's how you attack troops and tanks from down, say, eyeball to eyeball. Well, he, his airplane got all shot up, and uh, we made it back home one day. This, this was, this was taken long before that happened. He went through up to the mass unit, they patched him up. He was shot in the behind, and he got a, you know, he set the wound, because the wound wound is so He's probably walking. And whenever we meet, we have a club, you know, we meet once a year. Trust me, anytime we see this guy, we say, what, what do you tell your grandchildren? How did your grandchildren? I shot him behind. <laughs> but he kept, he didn't lose the airplane, though. Bullet holes all over the airplane. And, uh, but he was able to land it safe, uh, safe and he, he walked out. And this guy on the right hand side is from Connecticut. He just died just recently. The guy on the far right, right side. Of him. Okay, this is a, a photo of our very first black pilot U.S. Air Force to shoot down an enemy airplane. The very first guy. That's him. He was a nice guy from Ohio. And, and, and the, look at the far corner. You see the guy? Is that a bottle of Coca Cola? Yeah. Well, that was his reward. <laughs> a bottle of ice Coca Cola. For the first guy to shoot a German plane down. That took place while we were still in Africa. This is not one of the fighters that was a very good fighter. A lot of people don't know much about this one. It's called the Bell P 39 Air Cobra. Those of you who know, know the airplanes. This airplane, see that? That's a 37 millimeter cannon sticking out the nose. Guess where the engine is? The engine is behind the pilot. It was built by the Bell Company out in New York. Very good fighter for strength and dive bombs. You couldn't beat it, especially with that cannon. That's the one of the things that we we flew five different model airplanes, five different models before the war ended. This was my favorite. This is called a P-47 Thunderbolt. It had a 2,400 horsepower engine, air cooled. It carried eight 50 caliber guns. See those things sticking out in front there on the wing, and lots of enough enough fuel. See, see the, the the stuff I was telling you about the mesh on the grass so the plane won't sink down. That's, that's what the uh, engineers would place there for us. And that's a P-47 Thunderbolt. We flew those for a little while. And finally, we get to the one that they made a movie about the P-51s with the red tails. There's, there's a shot of one of our, that's a real shot over there in Northern Italy. Uh, why did we paint our tails red? In the 15th, there were 20 Air Forces, so 20. The generals running each one of them. The general, the general who was in charge of the 15th Air Force, which was based in Italy, said, I want my airplanes to be color-coded. He was leaving this. I want my airplanes to be color-coded. And they sent a list which said, you shall, you shall paint the epinage here, the paint epinage is the tail section, that's a French word, back to the tail. Red, glossy red, glossy red enamel. Your tail assembly will be, shall be painted that because we want to be able to identify who's up there. I want to be able to identify who's up there, the general. <coughs> every, every fighter group, there were seven of us, had to paint the tails of all different colors. It just so happened that we got red. Had they given us a checkerboard, we would, would have been known as the checkerboard squad, the checkerboard group. 
but instead we had red. And we thought that was nice that a red really contrasts up against the, 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 the silver aluminum air paint walls in there. It really is pretty. We had seven groups, with seven different color schemes, starting with red, yellow, candy stripe. I think I have one of them next week. Well, oh, there they are. That's, that's us up there. the red tails. I mean, my squad, the Tuskegee game with way in the back. With the salt. See the one with the checkerboard? That was another fighter squad. Fighter group, rather. And the one with the stripes. was another fighter group. And there were seven groups with seven different color schemes. And that's how, that's the truth, why we painted our tails red. I don't care what the guy said in the movie. There is no sergeant and no, no lieutenant on this planet who has the authority to, to, to man something like that, give an order like that. It doesn't work that way in the military. I came down from a high command, and that's why we painted on red. We didn't want to do it, but we had to. And it looked pretty good after a while. Everybody got, then after we were beating, beating each other, myself, back in my squad, meet some of the white guys in town, white Air Force guys, and that's how we addressed each other. They say, you're, you're with the red, red tails? Yeah. You're a candy striper? Yeah. You're a yellow tail? Yeah. And that's how we described each other. So this is 301. <laughs> 50 seconds and all that. And that's how, that's why it was a painted red. I don't know why they named the movie that way, but it caused us so many questions, you know. But that's why we painted them. We were, we were advised, we were ordered to paint them. And so we did. And they looked good. Here, here's something that uh, you hardly ever see. A P-51 Mustang has one, one seat for the pilot. But every fighter group had one that came from the factory with two seats. And uh, this is one of them. You see, there's two guys in there. And uh, since the war, after the war, rather, they, the federal government sold all these airplanes. You can get them for $15,000 a piece in 1950. And there are a lot of P-51s flying around. And I knew of club at most two or three of them. In fact, on September the 28th, on September the 28th of uh, this year, last year, one, one, of the, one of the ones that belongs to the, my club was visiting Maine, and I got to fly it on the 28th of uh, over Portland, about half an hour with it. But the two seater, because that, those things are worth a million dollars a piece, and the insurance companies like, I'll let any old body get in there. <laughs> in, the club, in the club, we, we, we're afraid that someone will break it. So I was the back seat pilot, and the other guy come. He's also also from Maine. He was the, he was the, the front seat pilot. I guess they flew for about 40, 45 minutes, which is what I used to do during the war with the two seater that we had here. When the flight was out on mission, sometimes this was sitting on the ground doing nothing, and we would decide to send up on a test flight, and one of the crew chiefs would sit in the back seat and fly for about an hour. That was a reward for me, for being a crew chief. Okay. And this, this is one of our officers in charge of maintenance, just so happy in the maintenance officer. He was in charge of all the mechanics for one squadron. Now, let me let you in on a secret. We, the Tuskegee Airmen, had, had the best uh, bomber escort, the very best bomber escort record. And I'll tell you the secret why, they didn't mention that in the movies either. Most of us don't even mention it. A fighter group has three squadrons. It, and they would launch 48 airplanes every morning protect the bombers. But guess what? We launched 64. Now, how could we launch 64 airplanes? We had one squadron too many. How did that happen? The guys down at the War Department screwed up. <laughs> they, when they decided to build, to have us fly as fighter pilots, they said, get one squadron. And it was only one squadron for a whole year. It worked out so well, they said, OK, let's make a fighter group. But somewhere along the line said, let's make a fighter group which calls for three squadrons. They forgot all about, we had a squadron already. <laughs> we became the biggest fight. We were the, the largest fighting group in the whole United States Air Force in World War II because of that. We could launch, big difference 16 planes could make on a mission. And that had a lot to do with us being the, the number one bomber escort group. Plus the fact that the commander demanded that we do, you know, protect the bombs and forget the German fighters. Okay. Now this is, now here's a real fighter pilot. You know, you're thinking of a tall gable and all those, <laughs> all those guys with their pretty uniform. This is what a real honest to goodness fighter pilot looked like. 
He's, he's 19 years old. He's got a ukulele. <laughs> he shot down three German planes, three of them, and he's visiting see the tents in the background. That's where we live. For the whole year, time that we both see, we've never lived in a building like this for two years. We lived in tents, six men to a tent. And you go back and look back. And, He's from Langston, is from out of uh, Philadelphia. And he and I went through basic training to Yale, because back in those days, I told you earlier, the Air Force was part of the Army. All of us had to be infantrymen. We took a two-month course, full basic infantry training before we could put our greasy hands in those airplanes. And he was in my unit. Now, if you look closely, you'll see his fly is open. <laughs> you see, that's the reason I took the picture. <laughs> I had a camera which was illegal as all hell. And the guys in the army don't World War II know you were not allowed to have cameras at all. And I had the camera, there was, was a Kodak folding camera that folded up about that thick, and you pull it out on the accordion track, you know, like it, slam it shut and put it in my plate. So you, couldn't, you couldn't tell. And I had a guy in, in the, uh, the squadron who developed film, the official photographer they called him, and I used to feed him caught in the cigarettes every so often he felt my pictures. And my mother used to mail the pictures to me, mixed in with candy and cookies and stuff for the troops. And that's how I got my film, and that's how I got it developed. But I was called into the old game two or three times because of it, because it was against the rules. Yeah, he was good. Very good fighter fighter. He just didn't look the part. He used to come and play the ukulele for me in the evening. I don't know why you're serving me. You know. right. And there's a, there's a shot of